So just know that you are part of this recording. If you don't want to be part of this recording, please exit the group now. So Leslie, before we start, I always like to introduce uh, the purpose of finding health. And so to give you that, I read my belief systems. And so I firmly believe that health is more than what you eat and drink, whether you exercise or whether you avoid certain items. I firmly believe that health is diverse, dynamic, and deliberate. I firmly believe that health is not possible under the hand of one practitioner only or one discipline of medicine. Um, I firmly believe that health is a person's primary responsibility and must be person-specific. I firmly believe that health must be conversed on physical, chemical, emotional, mental, spiritual, cult uh, cultural, racial, and various other undetermined levels. And uh, Leslie, I think you're going to help us with that one. And uh, I firmly believe that there must be a better way than this current status quo that we're in. So with that being said, uh, Leslie, you and I have known each other for a long time. You came to see me as a patient and you were in the corporate environment. And now you're uh, somewhere else. Let's, let's go with that. How did that happen? All right. So unfortunately, in this country, when you get to a certain age, they say, sorry for you but you're no longer productive, you need to go on retirement. And so in the financial services industry, for the most part, that is 60 years old. And 2019, I hit 60 and they said, goodbye. So yeah, it was a bit of a shock and a bit of a thing to get used to, but it is what it is and I knew it was coming. And so I prepared for it and I started working towards it. Um, still didn't make it any easier though having spent my entire working career in the corporate world, suddenly I wasn't working in the corporate world and it was not easy. So what do you do now? Tell us about this uh, E2 Life Coaching. I must realize I've never actually asked you the question, where does the E2 Life Coaching come from? Empowerment, enlightenment. Ah, so how would you define empowerment and how would you define enlightenment? So for me, they come out of the same stem. It's about sharing what I know with other people, putting them in a better position to be able to make better decisions, to be able to be empowered to make decisions for themselves. So it's about receiving information, putting them in a better place to make really great decisions for themselves going forward. Right. So when when you from your perspective define health, how would you how would you come to that definition of health? What would you say? Maybe a couple of words, a conversation. What would you define health as? So I think health is all about balance. It's not just what do you put in your mouth, how much energy do you have, how much exercise do you have. For me, it is mind and body and soul. One wants to make sure that one's soul is at peace. One wants to make sure that those three are all, al all aligned because if you're pulling in one direction with your physical health, but your mental health is going in a different direction, it's not gonna serve you in the long term. It may serve you in the short term. So for me, it's about getting those three all aligned, getting those three working together and pulling very strongly all in the same direction towards achieving one's ultimate health goal, one's ultimate life goal. Um, because if your mind, if your soul has been sucked out of you and you're in a job that is sucking your soul out every day, you're going to be high stress levels and everything that brings it with it. So when you're in a job you love, taking care of your body, your mind is in a good place, mind, body, and soul, all aligned, bringing it all together, all pulling in the same direction. For me, that's health. And I mean, I think a couple of things. I mean, I think uh, not that we want to talk about COVID because this is certainly not about COVID, but I think a lot of people had the soul sucked out of them through the last two years. And, and certainly I know when I deal with patients that are in corporate, corporate has this wonderful way of, of doing that. So 
uh, maybe a simple question of the people that you get to meet on a day-to-day -day basis of the people that you have met in your life how many people pass your definition of health not many for the first start most of them in a job they had um, and so if you get out of the job you hate get out of the job that instead of draining you every day, fires you up and fills you up and gets you energy and gets you out of bed and gets you murdered. If you can just do that as a start. But Leslie, I know, energy. I know we're going to have people say, but I need this job to pay the bills. I'm not for a moment saying walk out of the job without an exit plan and without an alternate, but get onto the journey of making the exit plans, putting them together, working hard at it, and getting that journey started. First of all, being aware that you're in a job that's sucking your soul out, number one. Wow. Acknowledge it. So how, how, do, you, how do you dive in? So you meet a person and you're now there to, to, to help them find this level of balance. You know, as a chiropractor, I, I, I'm there to look for where the imbalance is, because if you know where the imbalance is, you know how to start moving them towards balance. Talk us through that process from your point of view. So I think, Travis, it all goes back to what fires you up. What are you passionate about? What do you love? What do you love doing? What can you do for hours? And what can you talk about for hours? And then have a look and see whether the work that you're doing to earn your money aligns with that. Um, if I may, Travis, just give me an example. One of the things that I also do is I train new coaches. And in a recent training course, I asked one of the gentlemen, does he enjoy going to work? He said, oh, you know, it's such a drag. Having spoken to him for a little while, I asked him one simple question. How does what you do to earn your money align with what is important to you? And he simply answered and he said he doesn't. And that opened a whole conversation about what is really important to you? What do you love doing? And from there, we were able to go through a whole career change. And in the course of three, four weeks, this man was so energized because although he was still at the corporate that was really making him unhappy, he had an exit plan, he had an alternative, he knew that it was changing. And so there was light at the end of the tunnel rather than having this deep pit of despair. Having said that, many people love their corporate jobs and that's okay. But I mean, you know, Leslie, what, I, what, I, what, what you're saying is someone has to spend time uh, contemplating and yeah. again, I think there's two major factors for people is I don't have the money to do what I want to do. Or in my case, I don't have the money to necessarily be healthy. That's what I come across a fair amount of times. The other thing is I just don't have the time to, to dedicate um, to understanding myself and understanding what drives me and what motivates me and what builds my passion. How do we, how do we deal with that? So I think for me, the time one is easy. If it is important to you, you'll make time. And it's as simple as that. But it starts back with the awareness. If you are aware that something is making you unhappy, you can start a journey to get away from it, whatever that thing is. And it might be a six-month journey. It might be a three-year journey. It might be five. Who knows? But you can start a journey. So it's about spending that time and consciously choosing to invest that time in yourself because until you decide and you choose nothing is going to change so what you're saying is there are a lot of people out there that bitch and moan but they don't want to do something about it you said it better <laughs> it's all about taking responsibility you know a, a very dear friend of mine talks about the coat of arms it's everybody else's fault that I'm unhappy. No. Your choices, your decisions, your behaviors, your actions have brought you to where you are right now. Take accountability for them. Understanding that your choices, actions, behaviors, and thoughts brought you to where you are today 
empowers you because that means your choices, actions, behaviors can dictate your future. You've just got to be willing to rethink things a lot. But what, what I think, Leslie, is this goes a little deeper in terms of the, the cultural and societal and, and, and whatnot proclivities that we've been brought up into. Taking responsibility is not part of how we deal with things. Yeah. And Travis, that goes back to health. Stop blaming the entire world on your health and take responsibility for it. Be aware where your health sits on the scale of where you want it to be and decide, choose. So, okay, a person says, all right, I, I have the awareness that I'm not in a happy space. Um, I want to, you know, find more happiness in my life. Um, I now contemplate the things that I feel make me happy. Uh, I can imagine a lot of people are going to come up with some of those short-term uh, hedonistic activities. You know, good music makes me happy and uh, a nice cup of coffee makes me happy and, uh, you know, those sort of things. How do, we, how do we distinguish, you know, those sort of short-term versus those long-term uh, pursuits? So for me, it's all about the one degree. It's all about that little change. If you can think about an aeroplane taking off to Johannesburg Airport and it's heading for London, and it makes a one degree error in its journey, in its path. Unless it's corrected, it'll land up somewhere completely different. So we can flip that on the head and say, if I can just make a small change today and I can keep doing that consistently, that change will lead to another change, will lead to another change, will lead to another change. So if all that you can do today is listen to that music that makes you happy, do that. Do it tomorrow. Do it the next day. And after a little while, that becomes a habit. Then you think, okay, now what is the next thing that I can do? Or maybe the next thing that I can do is park at the other end of the shopping center parking uh, car, park, car park lot thing and walk to the front door. Maybe I can do that every day. Just little things, little changes, little bits. What makes you happy? Who are the people that make you happy? Versus who are the people who really make you miserable? And if they make you miserable, choose to disengage from them. You know, we live in a society which is, oh, you've got to spend time with your friends and family. Really? Whose law is that? I think some of the no, most, I think some of the most uh, offensive people for a lot of people I come into contact with is uh, their family, and family drama seems to seems to be a massive issue for many people. And do you buy into it or not? You know, I had a client who was so hell bent on her two sisters were fighting. All right, she made it her business to reconcile these two sisters. The minute I told her that it's got nothing to do with her, it's actually got nothing to do with her. And if she just gives the two sisters permission to sort it out the way they want to, it'll either get sorted out or it won't. But she needs to make very clear that she's no longer playing piggy in the middle. Don't come and tell me and come and tell me, tell the other one. So it's about drawing your boundaries, setting your boundaries, what makes you happy? If it doesn't align with what makes you happy, stop it. You have the choice, decide, and to, then work out how to. To, 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 move, to move this conversation forward, you've spoken about a journey a couple of times. When you mention the word a journey, give some, give some reference or some definition to that. What does it mean to be on a journey? Aren't we all on a journey? So we're on a life journey for sure. I mean, we get born and at some point in time, unfortunately, we're going to leave this mortal coil. But we get to choose our journey. Contrary to popular belief, many of us up until sort of school going age, legal to varsity, many of us have our careers chosen for us and we either go into family business 
is a but there becomes a point when you get to choose. I'm here in my life now. I want to be there. What does that journey look like to get me from here to there? Where do I need to start? What do I need to do consistently? And most importantly, who do I need to become to reach here? Who am I now? Who do I need to become? Because this person won't reach there. So in our life, we have chapters, kind of roughly every seven years or so, we change our chapters. And when we change our chapters, the who we were in this chapter won't service the who we need to become to succeed in this chapter. And so we continuously reinvent who we are, not what we are. That's a label. We're reinventing who we are. So we get walk from here. Uh, Leslie, I think you sort of moved in and out a little bit from a signal point of view. Uh, so hopefully it settles down. Um, my yeah, I've got a storm here. Yeah, the it's storm. Storming my side, Trevor. The storm passed through me uh, about half an hour ago. So uh, it most probably came from from my side to your side. I'm grateful because my signal seems to be, you know, pretty clear. So I apologize for that. So when you're talking about this concept of making a choice and working from that, uh, how much of that should be occurring in, in a person's head and how much of that should be occurring, you know, out in the open, perhaps uh, in the form of, of, of journaling or something of that nature? What, what is your conversation to that, uh, Leslie? So I think for everybody, it's different. I think what works for me may not necessarily work for other people in this audience. So I think for the audience, it's a case of finding out what works for you. But I keep coming back to this. It's a choice. Make the choice and then work out what you have to do. If journaling helps you, please journal every day. It's an incredibly powerful tool. Another tool that is really, really great is what, what I call free writing. And free writing is kind of like journaling, but the thing with free writing is you just grab your pen and your paper and you just write. You don't stop writing. You don't think about it. You don't consider it. You don't judge it. You don't understand it. And when you finish to read write, you close the book. You don't ever read your free writing. It's quite empowering to see how your thoughts develop through the process of free writing. Um, you talk to people, you know, um, get information, educate yourself, become aware, talk to people about the decisions that you're making so that they can support you on that journey. Because challenges there will be. The more people that you've got around you supporting you, the better chance you've got of getting there. I think that's an important one, Leslie, is, is a lot of people will make a, a choice or a decision in their mind's eye and then they keep it completely quiet to themselves you know if you if you're announced to the world i'm going to start doing something different there's some kind of accountability that happens you know that i've told the world that i'm doing this and now i'm straying from this journey I need to get back on that journey because I've told the world that I'm doing it. And it's not a case of judging yourself and beating yourself down. It's a case of saying, yesterday I didn't do such a good job at my journey. Today, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to make a concerted effort just for today on my new journey to, to do what I said. And certainly from my perspective, there's a part of the brain that's called the reticular activating system, and it makes you conscious of whatever you want to be conscious of. And what I've seen is when a person makes that thought process and makes that understanding and makes that decision, then the reticular activating system opens up their sensory input and says, hey, now you can start to see you've made this choice. Now you can start to see the, 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 the directions on a day-to-day -day basis. Leslie, you still there? Okay, so, yeah, I'm still here. so I think, Travis, you know, those opportunities and those things are always there. But it's only when the reticular activating system is busy. I call it the satellite dish. 
It's like when you go and buy a new car, suddenly you see exactly the same model and color everywhere. When suddenly if a couple are pregnant, suddenly they're looking at, they are just seeing all thing baby. That stuff was always there. It's just your reticular activating system wasn't focused on it. So if you talk about it, you make it a thing, you make it aware, people are aware about it. They'll check in with you, how's it going? Can I help? Did I? And it keeps getting that reticular activating system focuses back on what your decision was. And you've mentioned the concept of daily. I mean, I, I know that this is the most important part is whatever you choose to do, you have to do it daily. Um, it's not something that you can choose to do it maybe one or two days in the week and, and hope for the best. Um, but I find that a lot of people struggle with that level of perhaps commitment or that level of discipline. So Travis, I think it depends on what it is that you're wanting to do. Okay, so if you're wanting to run a marathon, getting out there and on the road every day might not be the right place to start. Maybe if, like myself, I started a small uh, exercise program at the age of 63, I've never ex exercised in my life. For me to go and join a gym and go and work out an hour a day, it's, it's not going to happen. But by saying, making dedicated before I get out of bed, I'm going to do eight, six to eight exercises every morning, lying on my bed because I can't kneel, I can't get onto the ground. Do these exercises. And I'm just disciplined with myself, six to eight seconds, six to eight exercises, 10 minutes, I can do that. If you know what I did, get it done today, I'll do it tonight before I go to bed. But it's the little steps. It's the incremental steps. Don't try and go for the big bang. You've got to build yourself up into the new rhythm, the new pattern of whatever it is that you're doing slowly. Otherwise, what's going to happen, and if Travis, if I can just for a moment talk about comfort zones. You have a zone of comfort around you, which is your, the, the, all the things that you are comfortable with. Surrounding that comfort zone is a zone of fear. To move out of that comfort zone into doing something different, doing something new, you have to step through that zone of fear. The problem with the zone of fear is it's a very strong zone. It's very narrow, it's very small. The minute you put your toes out through that fear zone, you get into a learning zone. And once you've mastered the learning, you get into a growth zone. So it's about understanding that that fear it's just really a decision. Do it. Get it done. Get into that learning zone. What? Because if you try and make that too big a step, what happens is that your body can't cope with it, your mind can't cope with it, and then what you do is you just rush back to the center of your comfort zone where you're comfortable. And, and what, I've, what I've seen lately is uh, some people's comfort zone is really narrow, and they're very comfortable in that. And they uh, are not willing to even look outside of that. And when you talk about the zone of fear, there was a wonderful movie called Buying a Farm with uh, uh, Matt Damon. And in that, he says that uh, you need to find five seconds of courage. Because once you have found those five seconds of courage and you're in the middle of whatever you need to do uh, to get to the other side, you're in the middle of it now and, and there's no turning back. Um, so in terms of the, the, the zone of growth, I, I, I like that. Tell us more about the zone of growth. So from your comfort zone, you're going to the fear zone and then into a learning zone. Now in the learning zone, let's say you're learning, I don't know, to do pull-ups on those crazy machines that you've got outside. Now you want That's to learn- That's what I'm do doing now. That's what I'm doing. I'm learning how to do a lot of pull-ups. So this is good. Keep going, keep going. I'm listening. So. You, you learn that how you've you got to hold that bar, how do you hold your knees, how do you hold your feet, how do you move your body, and so you go through that learning zone. Once you've got through that learning zone and you're able to implement whatever it is that you're wanting to implement, you learn get into a growth zone because now what you can do is you can say, okay, I know how to do these pull-ups. I'm comfortable with these pull-ups and now I can try 
moving my feet in a different way. So instead of holding your feet underneath, you crossed at the ankles for argument's sake, maybe I can pull my feet straight out in front of me and see how that goes. Okay, that will, will I learned that that's great and that's growth because it's development. Now what I can do is maybe I can crunch my knees to my chest and do it that way or do it inverted. Or, and so you stretch yourself and stretch yourself and stretch yourself. During this talk, Leslie, you've given two things which I think take the pressure off. Number one, you're not trying to make the big change, trying to make the small change. And number two, just understanding the comfort zone into the zone of learning, into the zone of growth. A lot of people have in their mind's eyes and particularly New Year's resolutions that, you know, I'm going to get the, 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 the change now, or at least I want the change now. Uh, and what you're saying is that the phase of learning precedes growth. So there is a middle section where you're doing things on a regular basis, maybe not necessarily achieving the result, but you're building that learning. Can you, can you dive into that somewhat? Yeah. You can never get, I mean, you look at a baby. A baby doesn't stand up and walk the first time. They stand up and fall. They stand up and fall. They stand up and fall. They stand up, they wobble, wobble, take four. And so you carry on and as that baby is learning to walk, it's learning what's working and what's not working. And so in that learning phase, it's all about understanding what are the steps that you need to do to get to your big goal. You're here in whatever world it is. You're here, you want to be there. What are the steps that you need to do? What do you need to learn? What do you need to grow from to get from where you are to where you want to be? And that is a progressive, every time you do it, you, you know, once you've mastered it and once you've learned, then you move into growth with how do I challenge myself? How do I improve this? How do I walk an extra mile? How do I walk an extra 50 meters? How can I do it just a little bit more? And so it's that understanding of once I've learned the basics of how to do whatever I'm doing, how do I get to that level? How do I use it to get to the next level? And I, I now get the concept of your journey, because the learning is a big part of the journey, yeah. those steps. And uh, I certainly know that is, you know, people will come to me as a chiropractor, and they have pain, and they want to not only be out of pain, they want to be able to interact with their kids again without having back pain. Um, and they want me to do something today. That's going to miraculously make the difference to, to that situation. And so when we, when we, when we uh, orchestrate those steps for that person, the person, you can see them go, ah. And then the fun actually is the journey to get there, not necessarily just the destination. I think it's about instant gratification. We've become a society that we want things, we want them now, and they must be perfect now. And life's not like that. And so when we get back to understanding that there's a plan, there's a strategy that you need to have to get from here to there, and that that is the end goal, and that end goal might take you two days, six months, six years, who knows? But, I mean, that brings to the point, Leslie, of, of having someone to work with. I mean... It's important to do it on your own, sure, but to have someone or perhaps many people to hold you accountable, to have that objectivity. I think, Travis, there are more than enough critics around us. And the more we surround ourselves with cheerleaders, both become your own personal cheerleaders, and the more you surround yourself with people who support and encourage and motivate you to stay the journey, the better you will have a chance of succeeding. But it's definitely not about instant gratification. You're not going to get up and run the comrades tomorrow if you've never run 100 meters. And so it's progressive. Every day, just a little bit more, a little bit more, and you'll eventually get there. There's a, there's a nice question here. I'm going to read it. It's uh, Just stay with me. So learning process can be started when a person wants to change or improve something. Um, that have to be done to move in the development process in life. But the question, how to encourage oneself to maintain that, not when you're initially motivated, 
um, and then stop it. How do you keep doing it forever, especially when we're in pain for a long period of time? So how do we sustain that? I think that's the, the main just of this question. Okay, so there's a concept in my world where we talk away, talk about setting a goal with a strategy that pulls you forward rather than a strategy that you're running away from. So let me use the diet industry. I want to lose five kilos is an away from strategy. We want to move away from whatever number you're, you're at. And the problem is the closer you get to that number, the less motivated you are. And so when you get to that number, you dash with the chocolate cake and it's self-defeating. But if you set the goal to rather live a healthy eating lifestyle, the weight loss becomes a step on that journey to a healthy eating lifestyle. It then becomes maintainable for much longer. And so even though after the weight loss journey is done and the exercise journey is done and everything else is done and it's in place and it's working, that I want to live a, eating, a healthy eating lifestyle will continue to pull you in that direction, will continue to motivate and encourage you. And I think that comes down to understanding of, of, of definitions. Um, you know, why does someone want to lose five kilograms? What's the point of that? Why does someone want to uh, eat a healthy uh, lifestyle? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a vast difference between those two conversations. Yeah. Yeah. And it's about what's important at the end of the day. I might want to lose five kilos because I've got to fit into this outfit for this wedding that I'm going to on the weekend. Or I might want to lose five kilos because it's five kilos on the journey to get me to a different place. So it's about understanding whether the goals are short term in nature or are they long term in nature. And I think the short term goals, once they roll up in a long to a longer term goal, will help to keep motivated. Right. Uh, we've got uh, six minutes left, so I've still got to get to the two questions, Leslie. But before, you gave a couple of really important tools, and I think that would help the people that are on the call and uh, because of the recording, anyone who listens. What would you say are some of the other tools that you have uh, suggested to your clients to work with that you know have made uh, a big difference for them? So I take most of my new clients, I take them through a values exercise. It's the very first thing that I do with them. It's an exercise determining what's really important to them. The amazing thing is that you realize that out of those things that are seemingly important, there's a whole ton of them that used to be important and are no longer important now. So as your chapters change, so the things that are important to you change. And as you understand that, you can let go of the things that are causing you stress and anxiety that you're chasing because they're not serving you. So I would encourage everybody to do a values exercise first off. Work out in this phase of your life what is actually important to you. Not, oh, I have to go and see my mother every Sunday because that is what good children do. No, that's somebody else's values that you're being forced to live. I must go to church every Sunday. That's the values you were raised Go to church if it's important to you now in this stage of your life. Don't go to church because it's somebody else's rules. And it applies to everything, you know. Don't eat this. Don't eat that. Are those your values or is that rule somebody else is insisting that you live by? Is there a specific uh, place that someone can, can go and do the values or find a way of working on their values? Is there like a structure that someone can work through? Look, there are many, many, many online, and so you need to find one that really works for you. Um, John D. Martini has a really good one. Um, that I was hoping you were going to mention is, that one. I was hoping you were going to mention that one. My one is based on. I've obviously I've customized one for for me. I go a lot deeper than that, but my one is based on his. But he's got a free to use one on his website. John, Dr. John Demartini, D-E-M-A-R-T-I-N-I. -I. 
Fantastic, fantastic. So uh, three and a half minutes left, Leslie. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any other questions. So I'm going to go to my last two questions. And these are obviously yeah. the important part of this podcast is to, to challenge people, um, you know, in, 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 in a direction of changing not only their health, but the global health care. Uh, and before I continue, thank you everyone for listening in. Thank you very much for attending. If you're not part of the, the broadcast list, you can send me a message. I will put my details in the chat box so that you can uh, find out when this uh, interview is online. So question number one, Leslie, uh, what would you like the future of healthcare to look like? And number two, how do we move in that direction? Thank you, Travis. So I think for me, the future of healthcare is all about empowering people to make really great decisions in the preventative stage. I think our healthcare system is very good in once you are ill, this is what we do to help you. But I think there's a massive, a lot of work that needs to be done in the pre-getting ill stage. How do you stay healthier for longer? And for me, there's lots that can be done. I think there needs to be a lot more work done actually by the medical schools bringing in alternative medication, um, alternate lifestyle living into their brain train our doctors on preventative health care. And for me, I think that the tandem with that is that the medical aids need to revamp. I think alternate preventative health care needs to be made more readily available to people. People who can't afford to go to, I don't know, chiropractors should be able to have a choice of do you want your savings account to be used in the alternate world or do you want it to be used in mainstream medicine? Um, for me, I think that people need to have a greater choice of how they, the fortunate ones who have medical aid, of how they get to use that medical aid. It's a very rigid structure. You get to spend 10 Rand on this and 20 Rand on that and 30 Rand and when it's finished, it's finished. Um, so I would like to see yeah, in just in summary, I'd like to see our, our young kids, and my nephew is one of them, who's actually in medical school at the moment, and we were talking about this recently, about how they basically are teaching the same theory they taught in the 1950s and 60s. Um, the world has moved on, and I think that the medical schools and the, the medical aides kind of need to come into the century where we're looking to to take responsibility and care of our own health in a way that we get to choose we get to decide and we're not told how to to look after our own health i hope that answers your question travis i think that's a phenomenal answer we've got less than a minute left so the call's going to die shortly but what you said is for the people that are fortunate that can spend the money to do whatever they want you know, the people that, that I think uh, health really matters the most to are the people that aren't fortunate. Uh, and, and I still would like them to have the choice. Yeah, absolutely. How, you know, and, but 